Good morning. I'm your host, Joanne Jobin, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sinjin Town Hall Forum, hosted by Vid Media. Before we start, I'd like to introduce Ben Landon, VP of Business Development, who will provide our viewers today with an introduction to Sinjin, a developer of autonomous vehicle technology for industrial organizations. After the presentation, I will be delighted to moderate submitted questions from our audience as per usual. And now a few words about the company. Sinjin's differentiated autonomous vehicle technology for industrial organizations allows existing workforces to increase productivity and efficiency. The company addresses significant challenges facing industrial organizations today, such as labor shortages, costly saving incidents, and increased consumer demand for e-commerce. And of course, I'll let Ben tell you the rest of this great story that we have here for you today. Now, before we get started, if you have any questions for the company, remember to place them into the Q&A tab at the top of your chat sections. And please ensure that you fill in the short questionnaire at the end of the presentation. This helps us and the company communicate more effectively with you for future events. And before I turn it over to Ben, please note the forward-looking statement at the beginning of this presentation. Ben, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, here's that forward-looking statement that we will now gloss by. To simplify what we do, the way to think about it is that we effectively create a Tesla autopilot for industrial vehicles. So the vehicle that you see here, this teal vehicle is what's called a stock chaser. Uh, this one is manufactured by our partner, Columbia. And what we do is we design the hardware system. We use off the shelf components. We'll get a little bit more into some of our strategy there and the advantages that we have in our design approach. But what we really do is we, we build the software that takes sensor data in from, the, from out in the world and ends up with all the AI, all the robotics work that happens in between so that these vehicles can then drive themselves. We're addressing a very significant market, over $200 billion, and we'll get into some of those details as well. So let's first rewind a little and really look at what's changing in the world and what the problems are that we're addressing. So when you look at the, the world of you know, industrial vehicles and, and work that's done in industries ranging from manufacturing facilities to warehouse and distribution centers to airports and seaports, there's a common denominator in that a lot of work is done by vehicles because you need to move heavy weight. You need to move things quickly, faster than a human can move or heavier than a human can lift. But the paradigm up until now has been that to make those vehicles be able to accomplish the work that they need to do, a human needed to sit on that vehicle. There was simply no other way to get for that vehicle to get its work done. Technology over the last decade or so has reached a point where that paradigm is changing. And we now have ways to decouple that human worker from the monotonous, heavy, often dangerous work that these vehicles need to do. And that allows us to address some of the pain points that are starting to, to be felt and have been exacerbated over the last few years associated with manual labor. I would say that when we got into this space, rewinding six or seven years, everybody was very focused on, on the cost of labor. And it's continued to, that pain point has continued to be more, more felt. You can see you know, the, the cost spent on warehouse workers here is quite substantial, $140 billion spent just across warehouses, not even manufacturing in the US alone. But as I'm sure many have noticed uh, from everything to news headlines and personal experience and everything that's happened, especially after the pandemic, uh, we're, we're actually, we find ourselves in a state where labor shortages are a much more significant issue now than, than purely the cost of labor. The cost is incremental, the labor shortage situation is existential. You either can get the work done with your employees or you do not have enough employees to get the work done. And this is where we start to talk about 
order of trillions of dollars of potential loss in GDP for jobs that can't be filled. I've, I've had a customer tell me uh, that their business was growing. They're a large uh, distribution company. They uh, and and this customer told me if I could hire 500 people tomorrow, I would, but I can't hire 10. So I work every one of my shifts 30 to 40 percent understaffed. And losses due to accidents. This is kind of a this is fairly consistent. I come from the consumer automotive space. Uh, worked previously on on autonomous driving companies for the roads for robo taxis. My my previous company was acquired by Tesla, so I, I'm pretty comfortable speaking about Tesla Autopilot as well. But uh, this losses due to accident piece is it's just true of the work that humans do. We do a lot of great things uh, as as a species, but we are fallible. We get distracted. We make mistakes. And that's true whether you are driving a sedan out on the road or whether you're driving a forklift. And the the losses that occur are expensive and often, you know, they're difficult to quantify as well because there is loss of life, there is injury, there are things that we absolutely want to be preventing and bringing to a zero incident type of world to live in uh, when it comes to workplace injuries. And the beauty of that, uh, the beauty of our solution is that automation solves is all of these issues, right? So by a machine doing the work of driving a vehicle around, uh, it doesn't care about monotony. So the variability of the work is not impacted by being bored or being tired. Uh, it can reduce the, the cost of the labor uh, because you don't need to pay overtime. Uh, you don't need to pay for the, for fringe benefits for for a machine uh, the safety is there it's 24 7 365 360 degrees zero distraction and the productivity a lot of that productivity comes from the machines can now do the boring repetitive work on their own which frees up people to do the work that is actually very unique to people that uh, we don't have ways to solve in an automated fashion yet so it's it's really a an additive function to getting work done productively, consistently, safely at workplaces is, is all underpinned by automation. And that's where we'll start to shift the conversation a little bit more to Syngin. So what's unique about us is that we saw the, the funding, the state of the art technology and pushing the envelope of new AI and robotics tech that was happening in the very, you know, the very big market opportunities, the ones that you that you hear about in the news, the likes of Waymo and Tesla and all the long haul trucking opportunities, these these trillion dollar types of opportunities. And we thought, well, what if we build to a similar standard? We follow similar designs, ride the coattails of uh, volumes of consumer automotive is always going to be higher than industrial vehicles. So sensor costs, computer costs come down. So what if we build in the same way, but when it comes to deploying the product, we put it in a simpler environment. So we build as if we're going to operate on the streets, but then we go deploy in a factory. And uh, that has yielded a unique solution for us uh, that provides these kind of robo taxi capabilities. You know, we had a DMV license. We did 10,000 plus miles on the road autonomously in the streets of California, 40 miles per hour, hundreds of people all around you in a downtown scenario, so that we could go to customers and ask them, well, what do you need in your manufacturing facility? And they'll say, well, I don't drive 40 miles per hour, I drive two miles per hour. And you might see three people per minute, not 100 people per 10 seconds. And that has really allowed us to go above and beyond and prove to our customers that automation, uh, autonomous vehicles can do everything they need and more and really check that box for them to feel comfortable to feel that we've gone above and beyond the safety standards that they would require for their site. And that's where we can start to understand the Syngin product. So we call the, the umbrella term for our product is enterprise autonomy suite. Uh, that's effectively our platform. You can think of it as sort of like an ERP, but for autonomous vehicles. So it's kind of where everything lives under this umbrella. 
And within that, there is the drive mod technology that goes into the vehicles. So that's the, the fancy stuff, the AI, the robotics, the, sen the sensors that make the vehicles be able to drive themselves. But to our customers, what matters is how to make those vehicles do work for them. So they're a little bit less concerned about what sensor fusion algorithms we use and what deep neural networks are running at any given moment in the vehicle. What they really see, their window to the product is, is what we call Stingent Insight. And that is, you know, that's your, your Apple, uh, your iOS feel type of app that lets you see, lets you manage your fleet. Where are all my vehicles? What are they doing? What are their, their health conditions? The, what are, what's the telemetry data on them? Uh, do I want to see a live sensor feed from one of them because it's, it's flagged me that it doesn't know how to progress beyond some un unexpected obstacle? All of those things live uh, within these simple software tools that let you then run very complex machines. And the Syngin Evolve side of it is our side of the data. Uh, so where, where our customers will focus more on pulling out operational analytics, understanding how the vehicles are, are moving around the site, we're going to be pulling sensor data off the vehicles and all sorts of more performance oriented data so that we can keep training new AI models from the field and simulating additional scenarios that maybe we hadn't seen before until we run into it out in the wild. And it, again, very much is inspired by the work that Tesla does in pulling all of that data. You know, they're, they're the ones really known for it, pulling all the data from the vehicles that they have out in the field to use real world data to continue to push the product forward. That EAS product is offered as a subscription license. So we price on a per vehicle basis. It varies, the pricing varies according to the target vehicle, how much it's utilized, the volume, typical pricing considerations. Uh, but the, the black text here that's in the bottom is what I think really, really drives the point home is if you look at your your average material handling vehicle uh, let's some sort of burden carrier stock chaser tugger these tend to be 10 to twenty thousand dollar vehicles so let's call it twenty thousand dollars they they have often an average lifetime of seven years so if you look at one of these the, in the current paradigm of you have to pay people to sit on them and move them around a twenty thousand dollar vehicle that you use for seven years with two shifts per day costs roughly $500,000 in human capital to operate. That is an incredibly skewed unit economic to in terms of making those vehicles do the work that you need to. So uh, we see that as our opportunity to improve to our customers, uh, to, to capture that kind of value uh, in that skewed unit economic scenario. And when you use that as sort of the, the quantum that you then build this, this market around, uh, which is the labor that it costs to operate these material handling vehicles, that's how we get to these really interesting opportunity and market sizes. So when you look at the vehicles that are out in the world, the material handling vehicles, uh, over 5 million, and that's assuming many of them are sitting idle, for a pretty significant amount of time, which makes sense. These vehicles have to charge. Most of them are electric. We primarily work on electric vehicles. And so you tend to have more vehicles than are active at any given moment. So with all those considerations taken into account, uh, with global uh, compensation data taken into account, uh, you see here the math that results in this very significant market of over $200 billion, 208 specifically, to uh, to automate these these vehicles according to to that to the current unit economic scenario, and that's that's our opportunity. That's what we're very excited to be going after, and we like to uh, to remind ourselves all the time of the the quote from from Jensen Wang, the CEO of Nvidia, that everything that moves will become autonomous. There's there's really no reason for it not to, and we're really entering into that stage where uh, we can we can do with technology more consistently and let's call it better overall than uh, than us as people have been able to in the past. And that begs the question of then how how did you decide to focus where you are? So 
obviously the the dollars speaks to that, uh, seeing that large opportunity. Uh, but you know the robo taxi opportunity, you know, being able to autonomously drive every Uber and every cab out there is a larger opportunity. So it begs the question of, well, why are you focusing where you are focusing? Why go after a two hundred billion dollar market when you could go after a two trillion dollar market? And that's where some of these factors come into play. So we've we've all seen the delays in you know there there were very famous well-known people saying that nobody would need a driver's license again come 2017 uh, we are clearly nowhere near that it's been pushed out to the extent that now nobody's really talking about the timeline of when that massive of a shift could occur uh, we're seeing just little hotbeds of a little bit of autonomous operation here and there in various little urban areas and there's going to be a serious question on how do you scale from you know running in running autonomous taxis in Chandler Arizona or in small segments of Las Vegas or San Francisco how do you scale that to New York City to Austin let alone overseas to New Delhi to Paris so that was that's something that we that we really think uh, is doesn't necessarily pay for the the difference in the market that can be gone after because the market that we're going after is so massive and it shortens that time horizon through having more structured operations so we when you're in a manufacturing facility you tend to be doing the same thing over and over and over again you're not faced with the problem of pick me up at any random point in the city and drop me off at any random point in the city and if you can't do it then you don't have a reasonable solution the routes are less complex that goes hand in hand and goes without speaking the speed requirements i already alluded to uh, we typically don't need to to move or can't move more than 10 miles per hour in any of these sites it's just not safe to do so that contributes to not needing as expensive of sensors uh, having a, a easier safety cushion easier ways to deal uh, with uh, with safe with fail safe behavior you know you you can just slam the brakes and stop when you're going three miles per hour and you know that you're not doing it in mixed traffic, you can't do that if you're going 70 miles per hour on a freeway and trying to automate a long haul truck. Uh, the regulatory hurdles are lower. We don't have to deal with the DMV or with NHTSA. Our customer is effectively the governor of the site. We can work with them to change infrastructure if it helps achieve the goals and we can move much faster. There's commonality from site to site. This is what I mentioned about how you scale from city to city. Well how a company manufactures engine parts in Mexico is probably pretty similar to how they manufacture engine parts in the Philippines. So you don't deal with the kind of nuances of uh, culture, traffic laws that uh, that occurs out on the open roads. The workflows are predictable. I mentioned you're, you're doing most of the same thing day in and day out. And this last one is huge as well. Uh, you're, you're not dealing with anything under the sun that can happen out in the open road. There's the kids running after a soccer ball from from behind cars i have personally seen data collected in san francisco at 2 a.m drunk guys stumbling out of bars jumping in front of autonomous vehicles to see if they'll stop uh, trying to win the darwin awards there we don't have to deal with that we have only trained personnel interact with our vehicles we tend to work we work behind the wall so uh, we don't work on you know in the retail floor even if we were to deal with some large distributor of consumer goods, we'd be working in the distribution center, uh, trained employees, people who are there making their livelihood working alongside the vehicles. And that just reduces the complexity, the safety concerns substantially. And it's why we've strategically focused on the area that we have because the market is still very attractive and the time to get there is substantially shorter. But because of how we've built the technology, we do see a progression over time to continue to grow that market opportunity. So I mentioned material handling vehicles is where we're focused. That's towing stuff around coming soon. We're going to talk a little bit more. Forklifts are really the very well-known vehicle in that area, and we're starting to make progress there. So material handling is where we're hyper-focused right now. But being a software-first company, uh, being vehicle agnostic, allows us to apply that technology to other types of vehicles, to other applications as well. So we are already embarking in the mining space. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment here. And we do ultimately see ourselves, you know, having started developing the technology on, on city streets, 
and winning customers for whom we'd be moving goods within their facilities, once a lot of those corner cases are squashed, once sensor prices, computer prices come down even more so that if, if push comes to shove, you put on an additional sensor uh, to see something that you couldn't see before, and that helps to reduce some of the risk. Once all those those elements are in place in a few years, we absolutely see it to be a natural progression that uh, we start moving things you know, middle mile and last mile for the companies that uh, we're already moving goods within their facilities for. So that is the the progression of how we see the company continuing to grow and grow and amass more market opportunity. So now let's talk about the progress that we are making in those spaces. We are on a paid multi-phase contract with a major mining vehicle OEM. Uh, it's very exciting space to be in right now. Automation has been there for some time, but we are sort of that new that new wave of technology. So introducing some of our AI features, doing things with sensors that have not been used yet in this area to, to bring a new level of capability, to bring additional redundancy into it is a very safety oriented market. And uh, the ability to work across many types of vehicles, which is not really true in how the technology is built in this space today, considering that they started building automation solutions for mining a couple of decades ago, where that technology architecture, that approach of software defined didn't truly exist yet. And so this is one that we're very excited about. Uh, we hope to have some additional news as to how this will be evolving into a commercial product uh, over the coming months and, and targeting that you know, commercial, commercial types of releases, I, I hope as early as 2024. And on the autonomous forklift, similarly, uh, we are on a paid contract to develop and apply our drive mod tech to electric forklifts. In this case, we're actually, our, our customer is the end customer, so not the vehicle OEM as it is in mining, but rather a, a site operator. So a large building materials manufacturer that we're working with to make forklifts autonomous so that they can replace their currently combustion engine forklifts with electric autonomous forklifts, which contributes of course to their automation, the costs, everything that I mentioned, as well as their sustainability. And we are going after a unique and novel use case that has not been automated yet, which is that we are going to be able to lift loads of up to 10,000 pounds, as much as 14 feet high, stacking them multiple stacks high. And it's a very exciting uh, development that, again, is targeting uh, 2024 production rollout, so commercial release in 2024. And I'm looking forward to being able to share more news about this because forklifts are really, that's that special vehicle that can do A to Z automation, pick up from anywhere, drop off anywhere, human not required in the loop to load and unload the vehicle as it is with, with some other vehicles that, that tow or that you load directly with your uh, via a person. Uh, so this is one that's very exciting and that we'll continue to provide news on as we make progress. Uh, we've already completed a couple of milestones with the customer and there will be more to come. And all of that plays into what is our strategy at large, which is land and expand. So there are a couple important things to take away from this slide. One is that we created this slide for our IPO, which was in October of 2021, to show what we generally saw as the, the rollout, the, the ramp up. I'm proud to say this slide has not changed since that IPO which means that we've been executing to the plan that we laid out almost two years ago. So we over-delivered on 2022, what we called phase one. We did more than one site. We took on our electric forklift contract. It was such a good opportunity that we, we took on that contract earlier than expected uh, because we had such good strategic alignment. And so we over-delivered on both of those. So now we're entering into phase two. We've already done, uh, we did those beta deployments with multiple sites. Now we're transitioning into commercial deployments. Uh, we've already got one site up and running at the beginning of this year. We're now putting together those follow-on sites. That one vehicle type that is commercially released is the stock chaser. So that's the one that's out there in sales mode where it's a question of how many of these can we place with customers. 
and we are getting up into those tens of vehicles uh, type of magnitude uh, so that we can continue to move forward, as you see there in phase three and phase four, expanding the number of sites, expanding the number of vehicle types, which goes hand in hand with exactly what I just shared with you. Now, so that's the executing to the plan piece. The other piece that's important to take away from this slide is the, the moat that it builds for us. So this is what lies in here is actually one of our biggest strategic advantages based on how we approach the market. So being a vehicle agnostic software supplier, working with many different types of OEMs, not limiting ourselves to a specific type of vehicle, what that allows us to do is to engage with a customer, automate a certain type of vehicle, pretty much across the board, uh, customers use more than one type of vehicle, even smaller customers, let alone you know massive customers like a Walmart or a Target who probably have dozens of different types of vehicles across their application. Uh, we are in a position to say, okay, we've automated this vehicle with you. What other vehicle would you like us to work together to automate together next? And what that does is it reduces the marginal cost. We don't need to remap the site across vehicles. Uh, the customer is already trained on how to use our tools, how to interact with our vehicles. So all it is is essentially populating a new vehicle uh, from the customer's end, populating a new vehicle into that Syngin Insight, into their fleet management tools. And for us, we are, we're are we positioned to do that quickly and we're getting better and better at it. We've already gotten our drive mod tech operating over 10 different types of vehicles autonomously. So when we make that investment to bring up that next vehicle, what we're essentially doing is growing the moat, uh, growing the barrier to entry for some other autonomy vendor to come in and do another vehicle for that, for that customer. Because if we've done the first, we've done the second, we've done the third, it reaches a point where it makes no sense to even consider another autonomy vendor to do the fourth or the fifth, because then you begin to incur those marginal costs again, you fragment your supplier base. And to me, when I looked at this a few years back, I said, that has to be the way that we do things because for a Walmart, for a Target, let's say they have 30 types of vehicles that they use that over time they want to be driving autonomously. I don't see a future in which they have 30 different autonomy vendors or even 20 if a few of them can do more than one vehicle it's just it, it would be 20 different data systems uh, 20 different interfaces i don't see that being a world that we get to so we we really tried to slice through into the future and see what do we need to build for to set up the right future so that this this approach has longevity and and doesn't end up getting nipped in the bud after people really figure out how to do this right so we're the ones trying to figure out how to do it right some of the achievements that I'd like to share with you before we will wrap up here soon. We've been building with an OEM. So Columbia, I shared with you, we're working first on their stock chaser vehicle. They have half a dozen other material handling vehicles in their fleet that we can't address. Uh, so we're building vehicles uh, together to go and serve customers autonomously with that commercially released stock chaser. US Continental is the first customer that we've spoken about that's using those autonomous stock chasers. They're using them in an indoor and outdoor application, which is unique to us. It comes from our experience operating robo taxis on the city streets and not many, I'd go as far as to say no other autonomous material handling uh, solutions providers can do that indoor and outdoor piece. Uh, so that, that was a big, a big reason why we won that business. We launched the DriveMod kit, which is the sensor, sensor and computer module basically has everything that is needed to make a stock chaser autonomous. Uh, all pre-integrated, pre-calibrated into a single module. We have a patent filed on that, and that's what enabled us to really kick into, into scaled preparedness with the stock chaser solutions. We talked about the forklifts, but that contract is ongoing. We have we released in 2022 our EAS 8.0 and made great improvements to our costs on the cloud side, all sorts of new features. We've now actually released EAS 9.0. We're going to have uh, more coming out about that in on out on the internet so that everybody can learn more of what that is about, but it's more about the usability, about customers being able to in, interact with the vehicles more easily, do fancier things with the missions, a new AI capability that allows the vehicles to understand when they don't have connectivity and default to uh, driving themselves back to some known area of connectivity. Um, so a lot of exciting just usability types of features. 
and the mining application we talked about as well is ongoing and and hopefully uh, have more news to share soon on how that evolves into a commercial offering. And I'd be remiss to not show some proof for all of the improvements that we can make. So I won't go into great detail here. There's a case study available online, but the bottom line is when you compare to two use cases that are very common, uh, even with the stock chaser vehicle that has people loading carts in the back, if you're doing something with pallets or you can load the bed directly, when we compared to people moving those pallets with a forklift from move it here on the ground to here on the ground, uh, the labor cost saving was 64% because you don't have somebody sitting in that forklift. Forklifts tend to be the, the most expensive material handling operators. The forklift itself is a much more expensive vehicle than some of the other material handling vehicles. So it's a case where if you don't need the forklift, there are significantly cheaper ways to move those materials, especially when you automate the, the traverse of those materials. And even when looking at the simpler ways to move things like an electric pallet jack that somebody pushes around, there we focus more on the efficiency gains and the ability to drive faster than a person walks to let a person continue to pick and pack instead of push a pallet truck around a several hundred thousand square foot facility which can be a 10 15 minute cycle time for them to get back to picking and packing we saw on the order of a, a one-third improvement in efficiency there now these i've mostly talked around so i'll, I'll sort of summarize them here our advantages, the, the, our technical advantages that lead to the strategic position that we're able to take and allow us to do that land and expand approach is the advanced autonomy piece. That's the, the Tesla autopilot for industrial vehicles. Instead of little Roombas that bump around, get stuck, ask for help, and don't provide the type of efficiency that the world has, has really expected, we have that robo-taxi capability. We can go around objects. We know that's a person, that's a forklift. This is how I behave when I'm near a person. This is the distance that I keep from forklifts when I see forklifts. And that allows us to uh, have much smoother operations to problem effectively lets the system problem solve on its own so that you can remain in autonomous mode and continue to do the work without human intervention. Let the humans do the jobs that they need to do. The multiple applications piece we talked about. So we've got stock chasers, we've got forklifts, we've got the mining trucks. We'll have additional material handling vehicles added to that EAS product suite as applications on the EAS platform. That stems from the work that we did up front, which was difficult, more difficult in the beginning, but now is paying off dividends to be vehicle agnostic, to have the vehicles be software defined, to use you know, pretty much every relevant sensor that you can imagine in all sorts of different configurations so that we have this very this good superset understanding of what can be done with sensors and that when it comes to okay now make a solution for this specific type of vehicle it tends to be some iteration or subset of something that we've already done and lets us bring up vehicles and have them operate autonomously quickly and then us being the software provider this this really plays it, it obviously is related to to that vehicle agnostic element that i just mentioned but it really plays a lot into our position in the market and our ability to partner with oems there's not a there's not a competitive element of us building vehicles that aim to cannibalize their existing incumbent solutions uh, while trying to sell them software which is something that that uh, is fairly common out in the field so we think by by really doubling down on being the software provider, we create more partner-oriented relationships. Uh, we allow everybody to focus at what they're really good at. And we also allow ourselves to, to operate like a software company, which means we don't need to inflate headcount to support manufacturing. Uh, we expect to have more along the lines of SaaS, software as a service, gross margins, as opposed to vehicle sales gross margins, which are significantly more attractive. And these are some things that are fairly unique, especially when you take all three of them combined about how Stingent approaches this market. This is just to, to give you an idea of what our ownership looks like. I won't go too deep into this. The, the few points to make is we were, we were backed by top tier VCs when we were a venture backed company, the likes of Benchmark, Andreessen Horowitz, Redpoint. Uh, they're still significant shareholders and otherwise our, we have very significant inside holding. So it's all just to say we have a very a very healthy cap table and 
uh, that we're, you know, we're very proud of, of where we've gotten to today and the, the trust that was put in us in some of the top tier venture capitalists in the world. So the takeaways, big market, over $200 billion with the opportunity to grow as we carve out success in that existing material handling market and grow into mining and other applications. The, our approach is differentiated in terms of leading with software, being vehicle agnostic, which leads us into those key strategic partnerships that we have nailed down and will continue to nail down, ranging from OEMs to service providers to system integrators, uh, really puts us in a very partner-oriented light in approaching this market. And I can tell you from years working in autonomous vehicles, I, I said I say it takes a village. It's I mean you when you go and you really deploy at a site, which we've had the experience doing several times now, you realize, hey, I I need to worry about the 4g or 5g connectivity here i need to worry about how good is the internet connection how good is the wi-fi coverage you know how do, do i need to bring in somebody to change how we interact with these doors that need to now be opened in an automated fashion it really touches just about every element of uh, technology that that we really that are at the fore today under you know the industry 4.0 type of umbrella and connectivity and cloud uh, so we don't go it alone just to say we don't reinvent wheels that we don't need to and finally, we're very proud of our team. We, we have an experienced executive team, both in private and the public company sphere, and obviously going through the process of, of going public, which we did with a traditional IPO. And we're very proud of the engineering team that we've built up. It's, you know, we are a technology and AI and robotics company. The vast majority of our headcount is in R&D, and we're, we're very happy with, with the team that we've able to, been able to pull together. And with that, I will say thank you and turn it over to questions. Thank you very much, Ben. That was a fantastic update, super informative. I mean, I learned so much. And I can see by the questions that many of your shareholders actually appreci appreciate the opportunity to interact uh, in, uh, directly with you. So with that, I'll take a few questions. And please, uh, just a reminder, put your questions into the Q&A tab so that we can see them, we can publish them, and you can upvote the questions with the little thumb emoji. So we can start asking questions in the order in which you would like us to ask them. So let's start with the first question, Ben. Other autonomous driving fir firms have struggled to bring their technology to market. What's different about Syngin? This is where I would direct you to the the slide that I spent some time on, which which we went through the the commonality of sites and uh, working with trained employees. So I think what has been really slowing down autonomous vehicles, the ones that we hear about the most, the Teslas, the Waymos of the world, is that they they operate in a very difficult you know, Pareto optimal type of curve. So to, let's let's de-jargon that a little. And and what does that actually mean? It means that the roughly the remaining one percent of the problems that they need to solve, so that they can confidently operate under all conditions in the areas that they want to operate, might take them ninety nine percent of the work. Because that's where that's where I mentioned the the problems, and I used to be asked these problems by you know the my customers. Uh, at my previous company before it was acquired by Tesla, our customers were the likes of Audi, BMW, GM, like, right? The, the questions that we were asked were, can you tell the difference when you're going 70 miles per hour on the highway between a plastic bag that you can drive through and a piece of a tire that you can't drive through, right? Or if a child runs out from behind a vehicle and you're going 30 miles per hour, how are you going to make sure that you don't hit that child? So these are problems that are exceptionally difficult to solve. Uh, and not only, those are the ones that come to mind, that people know, those are the, the known unknowns. The unknown unknowns are practically endless when you're out in the open world and anything under the sun can happen. So I think we will solve that problem. Let me just say, I'm, I'm super bullish on autonomous vehicles out on the roads. And there's a good reason that I left a cushy job to join a five person startup that was doing autonomous vehicles for, you know, autonomous vehicle solutions perception for robo taxis. So I'm, I'm a strong supporter of it, but it, it will take time because there's so much to figure out and not all the data's there and the costs are still too high, 
you know, you still have to drive hundreds of thousands of miles to make the unit economics work when you're competing with cabs and Ubers and subsidized buses. Uh, and that's why we're taking a different approach. We're not looking at that space because we want to work where kids can't jump out from behind cars. Uh, people are trained. You're driving three or four miles per hour, not 50 miles per hour. Uh, the unit economics I talked about are much more in our favor. We don't need to drive the cost of sensors down into the ground because you're making, you need to make 25 cents a mile to compete with cabs. No, we're, we're in a state where you'd be paying somebody $4,000, $5,000 per month to sit on this vehicle and they don't even want the job. So all of those contributing factors, both from the technical perspective and from more of the financial or you know, business monetary perspective, are very much what shortens our our time horizon to market, and it's why you know case in point we're out there we're out there winning uh, business with customers today with our commercially released stock chaser. And hey, credit to a lot of automation companies that work in the space that uh, came to this area before us. You know, the, maybe they they use some of that older tech that I mentioned, not that robo taxi level, but they've carved out very nice pieces of business for themselves already. Uh, there, so it's it's really a, just a different world from uh, the delays that we're seeing out on the open roads. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions here regarding your recent hires, uh, and one has to do with the new senior engineering hires. Uh, so, what do you think they bring to the company? And the other uh, question related to hires. Uh, is your new head of sales. And when do you think that they will be able to announce additional commercial deployments? Great question. There is a common thread across all three of those hires. So let me just be clear in terms of who we're talking about here. So we hired a new VP of engineering named Sean Stetson. We hired a new VP of engineering services. So the VP of engineering, Sean, focuses more on the development uh, R&D releases, whereas the VP of Engineering Services, uh, Felix Singh, focuses more on uh, its customer success, its QA, its all, kind of all the back-end work that's not really new development, but is required from engineering, uh, managing all of the vehicles that are out in the field. And that third hire, the head of sales, is Chris Wright. So these, these three folks have something, a common thread, which we really by de we designed for when we were on our search is that they are they all came from robotics and automation companies that were a few years ahead of Sinjin. They did, like I said, they did it with sort of for the most part uh, a previous wave of technology. Uh, our robo taxi advanced autonomy piece was unique to us and took longer to bring to fruition, but they've done it. I mean, they had each one of them saw thousands of automated vehicles go out into the field. So Felix and Chris actually work together at a company called BrainCore. They do autonomous sweepers. You know, they've got Walmart and Kroger as customers. They've got thousands of bots out in the field. Uh, Felix and Chris were both there. Chris doing the selling, Felix doing the scaling and seeing that fleet grow for thousands of robots. And we said, Hey, if you've seen that work already get done, that's exactly the stage that we're in. Come over here and do it for us. Now with Sean, uh, he he was the VP of engineering for a company called Seagrid, which uh, designs and uh, and you know releases and manufactures autonomous forklifts, but they're smaller forklifts, right? So you meant, you remember I mentioned what's unique about our forklift is the ability to do 10,000 pounds and it's not our forklift, we're not building it, but the, the use case that's required for the customer is that we're automating a forklift that can lift 10,000 pounds. Seagrid was down in the low thousands of pounds, but they carved out great success. They've, they've got hundreds, if not even thousands, I don't know the exact numbers of these forklifts out in the field, and Sean was there for years overseeing that, that development, that release. And clearly that dovetails very nicely into the concentrated effort that we have on forklifts now. So having had that experience with companies that have gone through the phase that we're just entering into was something that we, that we really tried to optimize for. And I'm very happy with what we came out of in that search. Now on sales specifically, 
Chris is getting up to speed. We're building up a healthier pipeline. We're you know, doing the typical dance between sales and marketing to continue to fill that top of funnel so that we can get more, more conversion, get more deals coming down the funnel. It is still an industrial sales cycle that we operate in. So it's not exactly the same as signing somebody up for a CRM on a website and making a sale in 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, we, we are bolstering that funnel, that sales pipeline, and the, the focus for that team, which is still a growing team, is to get deals over the line that we'll be sharing with you soon. Great. All right, let's swing over to the mining sector, which as you know, is near and dear to my heart. Um, I find it fascinating. I mean, I've been around mining for <clears throat> a long time. I'm not gonna say exactly how many years, but it has been a while. Um, and of course I've been underground, I've been through open pits and all sorts of different scenarios in the mining industry. And, you know, yes, there's a lot of automation going on underground. Um, and do you see this continuing for you underground or do you see it more as an open pit exercise? So at the moment, we the, the current the current project and the current solution that we're working on is for open pit. There the. Our, the the reason that we are a little bit more wary about getting into underground is just purely the the conditions. Uh -huh. It's you, you know you wouldn't say it's necessarily it's not our direct problem as we're not we're not building the hardware, we don't manufacture the sensors, uh, but it becomes our problem when our system relies on reliable data from those sensors to be able to operate and to offer you know the level of service that we guarantee to our customers. So right. There, you know, there are things that that work in the underground environment's favor. Uh, for example, you know, you always there's if you're using lidar, for example, it works in the dark. You don't need lights. You're always going to be able to see the walls around you. And assuming that they're not like completely uniform tunnels, it's actually you're going to have quite a lot of information about where you are because you're constantly surrounded by unique features. So there's some things that work in favor, but we just believe that for a lot of these new sensors, I mean, we I mentioned they're coming first from automotive, which is all, it's a it's a ruggedized environment. It goes through a whole lot of testing, but it's a whole new level to take those sensors into underground, you know, dust filled, salty types of environments. And oh, yeah. so so we you know, it's it's a problem that I think that's one of those cases where we want to wait for the fields to solve a little bit of the problems that we are reliant on for our solution to operate as well as it can there, uh, which yeah. is why we're focusing more on open pit where of course, obviously still very ruggedized and harsh environment, but a little bit clearer path to how do you get the sensor to work in that environment and not have that be a failure mode within your system, which again is why we're not going it ourselves. We're not going, we're not coming to the mining market with here's the retrofit autonomous vehicle system that we've designed for you. We're working with an OEM so that we tell them, hey, these are the sensors that we're using. This is what's been able to accomplish the solution that we set out to accomplish together. And then that OEM with their with their clout, with their bankroll, is in a position to say, all right, I'm gonna make sure these get manufactured to the standard that I have as an OEM so that your solutions work without disruption from the sensors. So that's how we're looking at it right now. Um, yeah. And open pit mining is, is where our current commercial agreement is. Yeah, well, I would agree with you. Open pit is definitely a little easier. You know, I've been, on, I've been in some really big mines and I've been in some really small mines um and it just you know really depends on what country you're in as well all the rules and regulations are are very very different so interesting answer i uh, hope you'll have hope you'll be coming back to talk to us more about that um all right let's let's swing over to some questions about stock performance um we've got a couple of questions here uh how has your stock performed since the ipo uh what do you think the ca next catalyst will be going forward and we have one more question regarding stock. Maybe we can answer the two of them at the same time. And that would be looking at the ownership pie chart. What percentage of shares do you view in that float available for open market purchase? Sure. 
a lot of these questions I'll, I'll give pretty vanilla answers to since it's one it's that's mostly out there to be looked up and two mm -hmm. uh, i need to be careful not to formulate opinions or <laughs> give any sort of guidance that i shouldn't so the the stock since the ipo uh, has unfortunately <laughs> not performed as we would have hoped of course uh, we IPO'd in October of 2021, and I think anybody who's following the market at all knows what has happened pretty much across the board since then. Uh, we, we did not SPAC. We IPO'd. We did a traditional IPO. We went through the whole process. Uh, as part of that, I believe that we priced our IPO quite pragmatically compared to the types of deal structures that you see from SPACs that tend to take on a lot more cash and generally inflate the valuation of companies. Uh, we were much more pragmatic. Our $7.50 opening price per share equated to roughly a $250 million market cap, which we thought was just about right for where the technology was and the fact that we were pre-revenue at the time. Unfortunately, we got punished alongside all of our peers who did SPAC, who were EV and AV companies that were burning orders of magnitude more cash than us. And so since then, you know, we're, we're right there with our peers. We, we rode the wave down with everybody else. And in spite of executing on the goals that we had, I shared with you the milestones, the updates, the patents we've filed, our stock has come down on the order of 90% since the IPO. Uh, so yeah. obviously not where we want to be, and we are the we're doing everything that we can to to improve that ranging from sharing the news that we do have to share uh, we do see some positive responses to uh, to some of the updates that we do provide uh, but more than that just working on working on fundamentals working on making those sales uh, we we did grow our, our we went from pre-revenue to starting to report revenues over the last two quarters we grew that revenue substantially right. Uh, but it was engineering service based revenues or NREs for the projects, the new autonomy deployment projects that we're doing or the new autonomy development project. And so we're looking towards making that more of a fundamental annual recurring revenues to to build, you know, really build out the, you know, a strengthened bottom line for the company that's doing everything okay. in our power to do those things. And well, you can only control the things that you can control, right? You can't control the markets. I mean, I know I've been in the gold industry for a long time and you know it's up and down up and down. And as we say, you know, you can only control what you can control. So the best revenge is just to be quietly efficient and quietly successful and eventually the market will wake up. So, you know, just keep working away. You guys are doing an amazing amazing job. I I'm just blown away by this story. It is so fascinating and so interesting. Um, one more question. We are at the top of the hour. Um, as labor comes back online, you know, and, and I think you mentioned it through your presentation in regards to COVID, you saw a lot of this fall off, which helped your business quite a lot. Um, do you think that will affect some of your sales strategies or do you see it just completely taking over the industry? I... I frankly do not think that we are in a place anymore where there should be a concern that companies do not want automation. So if you rewind to when I, I went from electronics for consumer vehicles in general, so infotainment and ADAS, which was starting to border on autonomous vehicles, when I stepped into an autonomous vehicle focus about six or seven years ago, my my meetings with with customers, with with partners, with investors were very different than they are today. It would start by convincing people why now was the time to start focusing on autonomous vehicles and that it was coming and the tech was ready and the value propositions were great. That is completely different now. In the last three years, I mean, 200 year old companies reach out to us and say, we have a strategy to automate and we need to know how we're going to do that. There's, there's no more of this, will they, won't they? And is this the right thing for me? 
the world the world has wised up to what they can get by freeing up people from sitting on vehicles and letting them do other work that's more valuable and even if we do see a you know a bounce back in unemployment i'm not you know i don't follow it day to day but i don't think that it's trending in that direction i think it's actually yeah. still trending in the negative direction so i don't expect there to be this this massive recovery where all of a sudden you know there's there's more people wanting to sit on vehicles to do mundane jobs than there are vehicles to be sat on i think the yes. world is trending farther and farther from that from that reality and so i only expect this to be strengthened over time it's not it's it's not a thing that keeps me up at night that people tell me they don't want to automate vehicles anymore right and you know that's a really great way to put it because you're not really taking away jobs from people you're actually uh integrating a new form of technology that will help people do their jobs better and and benefit the companies as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. Uh, thank you, Ben. We are now really at the top of the hour. Um, we're going to end our town hall. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you have any further questions uh, for the company. You can email them to Ben, ben Mimak directly at ben.mimak at sinjin.com. And just a reminder that this town hall forum will be available on Sinjin's website and on our platforms within 24 hours. So thanks everyone for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to host you, Ben, and we'll see you soon on the next Vid Town Hall Forum. Thanks for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.